G'day, Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series, and welcome to another episode in the Origin Series. In these episodes, we look at key pieces of technology that the humble adventurer and explorer uses on a day-by-day -day basis. And today, what we're going to be looking at is the origin of the off-road going tyre. It's an amazing piece of kit when you think about it and how much we actually rely on tyres to get us to those destinations that are a little bit unknown. They take a huge amount of punishment and the funny thing is, the actual idea of having an off-road going tyre is a relatively recent innovation, you could say. So it should be an interesting episode, so stay tuned. So before we get started, big thank you to the team at Toyo Tyres and also the team at Tyre Wright Kalgoorlie Boulder. If you're heading out into Outback WA and you're passing through Kalgoorlie and you need a spare tyre or a new set of tyres, go see Steve and the team at Tyre Wright Kalgoorlie Boulder. They'll certainly give you the right set of tyres to get your trip up and going again. But in order to actually understand what the off-road going tyre has become today, we have to take a step back, and a step back in time. So obviously we've got the tyre itself, but the tyre is actually only one part of a larger piece of equipment, and this is actually the wheel. To understand the origin of the wheel is to understand the origin of the tyre itself. Now many of us probably don't realise, but there was many, many, many moons of where people actually didn't have access to wheels. But you look at some of the wonders of the ancient world and what people were able to achieve without actually using tyres. Look at the pyramids in Egypt, look at Stonehenge in Britain. It's amazing to think how these people actually were able to construct these massive monuments. But what was first realised was that you could actually use a cylinder to move large objects. Now, obviously, the world's moved on and it's changed quite a bit, and uh, you know, I think it's probably for the better. Um, a lot of people don't like using slaves anymore, and I think that's a good thing. But back then, it was the way to go. If you had an army of slaves, then you could move anything you liked right across your land or across your county or kingdom. And so, what they would do is obviously, particularly in Egypt, is they get these large logs and they would make virtually like a conveyor belt and put these large slabs of stone on and they would actually pull them not just a few hundred metres but kilometres. There's actually been found granite that has been moved over 40 kilometres and I'm not just talking about a little boulder, I'm talking about chunks of stone that are weighing 10 to 15 tonnes. That's incredible and over sand too. So. There were means of moving around large objects uh, before the actual invention of the wheel. But the Middle East, and particularly Egypt, was really sort of the, I guess, the origin of civilization, you could say, to a point. And this is actually where the first, or what we know, the first example of the wheel has actually been found. And obviously it was made out of stone. And this really starts our journey here. Stone is incredibly effective. It's very hard, it's very resistant. But the problem with stone, and this is something that happens with any new piece of technology, you develop it and then the issues obviously arise very quickly. And then you've got to obviously adapt it and change it to obviously negate these issues. The problem was was that stone doesn't have the ability to absorb shock. It just doesn't. And it's very brittle. So what would happen is you would obviously get your stone wheel, you'd punch a hole in the centre, you put an axle through it, and then you'd pull it along. But what would happen is you would travel over terrain, terrain that was actually harder than the stone wheel itself. And this would cause chips to obviously come off the wheel. 
it would c cause for fatigue due to the impact of rocks and all the rest underneath the actual wheel itself and over time you would get fatigue forming and this would have happened to more than just one fellow back in the day it would probably actually end up cracking right through to the axle and you'd be there going oh gee I wish I carried a spare but you wouldn't have been carrying a spare because they're so so heavy so you'd have to go back and spend a week in your quarry chiseling out another one and chiseling it out wouldn't have been an easy feat either because steel and iron hadn't been invented yet so this was a real problem so people then started looking at going towards wood and we've all seen pictures of obviously ox carts with the big wooden wheels on the side but wood in itself is fantastic because it's much lighter and therefore it's actually very flexible so what I mean by ductile is it has the ability to be moulded and bent and shaped into different things and you only have to look at the, the beams of a church or a large uh, wooden structure and you can see how you can actually bend wood into these beautiful curves and all the rest but the problem was with these wheels at the time is that they were completely and utterly solid wood and the problem with wood is is that it's porous so it has little holes in it so it has the ability to actually soak up water and the tree needs to use this it needs to be able to soak water up from in the ground and obviously pump it up within the actual fibers in the tree itself to get out to the leaves so it could then, it can then grow but in death obviously and when we decide to use it human beings this is actually a real problem because if you're in obviously a wet climate it's obviously going to get completely and utterly saturated and then you get some warm days ahead of you and instead of going out and admiring your very very nice looking ox cart with its straight wheels you'd come out and it would just look like a wave it'd be completely and utterly bent and bowed and all the rest so this was a real problem the other thing is too is that wood is very very soft so once again traveling across hard rough rocky terrain it would chip and break parts off the actual wheel itself and any imperfections in the grain it would cause the actual wheel to split so this was another problem too so it wasn't until the iron age many moons later that we actually start to see a real quantum leap happen in the actual design of the wheel itself and this is where we see the first example of the actual tyre itself or the actual idea of using something to actually protect the overall wheel construction. Now this is so, was so successful it's actually used right up until this day with wheels that are used on obviously carts that are pulled by horses or horse and cart. Basically what they came up with was that they could actually create a large ring of steel, quite thin, and they would make it virtually to the same diameter as the actual wheel itself but by heating it up and when you heat up metal it actually expands ever so slightly so they would heat this up in a furnace or furnace probably not a furnace hopefully not but obviously in a coal fire and then they would pick it up they would put it over the wooden wheel and then they would quench it with cold water and this would actually contract now the advantage of that was immense because this meant that you could actually change the overall design of the wheel itself and you could make it much much lighter now by doing that you could actually use a thing called spokes now we all know what spokes are and but the idea of spokes is obviously to help obviously give strength to the wheel itself but it also means that we don't need to use a solid material on the inside of the tyre itself or sorry the wheel itself and so therefore it makes it much lighter now because they are able to use spokes they could obviously cut the material that was needed to be used to make a wheel down significantly by making it lighter the poor oxen in front or the donkey could actually run a little bit faster for a little bit longer so that actually gave you a massive edge and particularly if you're a defending or an invading army and you had the ability to run a few more miles than old Joe Blow from down the block then 
you're probably going to catch up with him and give him a little tap over the head. So there was actually a massive, massive advantage um, in that development there. But it wasn't until around about the 1500s and sort of towards the Renaissance period that we actually see rubber actually being used. And one of the reasons why rubber wasn't used up until this point was no one knew about it. No one had any idea that rubber existed. And it wasn't until a little man hopped in a boat from Spain and he went all the way across to America and stumbled across this impressive continent. And this was a gentleman by the name of Columbus. The Spanish obviously found many, many things in the Americas. They found cocoa, they found gold, and many other weird and wonderful things. But one of the things that they noted was when they went into these villages, there was kids playing with these round spheres, these balls, and they'd throw them on the ground and they would actually bounce. Get out of here, they'd bounce. Well, you've got to remember that at the time, if you wanted to go and play tennis with your friend on the tennis court, they would actually use a sack, and this was filled with grain or barley, and then you would have to try and hit it and hope that it, the other person wouldn't let it land on the ground, otherwise you'd have to start all over again. So it wasn't much fun. So by finding rubber, they actually realised they could use this for a number of different industrial purposes. With the advent of the Industrial Revolution and obviously Britain becoming one of the great leaders in the uh, harness of industrial power and might through the steam engine and all the rest, in the 1800s we started to see vehicles actually move across the landscape without using horses. Due to this, this meant that these vehicles were much, much heavier than anything else before that had actually moved across the landscape and they could travel at much, much greater speeds for a much, much greater length of time. And so this brought in a whole myriad of problems. Obviously they needed a strong wheel, so they would use cast iron wheels or steel wheels to actually support the actual overall vehicle itself. But the problem is with steel is one, you don't have very good traction. And the other problem that you have too is that actually doesn't absorb any shock whatsoever. So this actually limits the speed that you can travel at. So a lot of steam rollers would only be able to travel at about four miles an hour at top speed, which is probably about six, six kilometers an hour. So no more than really walking pace or a brisk walking pace, I guess you could say. So what they came up with the idea is that they could actually use rubber and if you look at a lot of old tractors, and particularly an old, a lot of old traction engines, some of them will actually have on their front wheels, there'll be a cast iron design of the wheel itself, and then they'll actually have a thick, solid rubber band on the outside. And this was really the first tyre itself that was to be developed, the solid rubber tyre. But the solid rubber tyre was absolutely brilliant. Many, many people really appreciated it and it was the tyre of choice during the early 1800s and towards the late 1800s. But there was a man by the, man by the name of R.W. Thompson. And R.W. Thompson was a, a fascinating man. He, he was really too far ahead of his time, you could say. And he actually developed what is known as the pneumatic tyre. And the pneumatic tyre is what we know as a tyre today. It is an air-filled vessel. Now, you've got to remember this is 1845, so rubber really isn't what it is today. So, to create an inner tube on the inside of the tyre, he actually used leather. And I'll show a drawing of this tyre design because it is absolutely fascinating. So, he used a number of different inner tubes inside the tyre itself. So if you got one puncher in one of the inner tubes, the tyre wouldn't go down. So you could keep on using it. How fantastic's that? And obviously it meant that the actual wheel construction itself, because the tyre was filled with air as opposed to solid rubber, was much, much lighter. Now the reason why this came about was due to the popularity of the bicycle. It was due to the popularity of the bicycle. Now, bicycles at this point in time actually used wooden wheels, so you can imagine it was a pretty old, bumpy, uncomfortable ride going down a hill. So, to be able to actually have a tyre that was air-filled and be able to actually take all those bumps in and actually 
take all that shock in was a real, real step forward. But the problem was no one was willing to actually take it on. You can understand the complexity of the design was obviously very, very um, difficult to manufacture back then. So sadly, R.W. Thompson, as many inventors of the period, died penniless and his name somewhat got forgotten until now. But it wasn't until the late 1800s that we really sort of see a expansion of the combustion engine and obviously uh, the components that go along with it. And this was actually by a, na a gentleman by the name of Dunlop. And Dunlop was actually fiddling around with his son's bicycle and by accident he actually reinvented the tyre. He didn't know about R.W. Thompson, at least I don't think he did, but basically what he did is he reinvented the pneumatic tyre, but he made it much, much simpler. He obviously knew that he could obviously make a cocoon or an actual tyre itself and he could fill it full of air. But instead of using multiple inner tubes, he just used one single inner tube and he made it out of rubber. Luckily for Dunlop, bicycles were hugely popular and there was a race in Belfast in Ireland. Now, the actual gentleman who raced on this bicycle and actually had Dunlop's tyres on it actually won the race and that put Dunlop's name on the world map in regards to tyres and this would start the Dunlop Rubber Tyre Company. Now, getting towards the turn of the 19th century, 18th, 19th century, we saw Firestone, the Firestone Rubber Company, or corporation, come to be. And Firestone's big innovation was actually inventing vulcanised rubber. Now, vulcanised rubber is very interesting. It actually injects carbon into the mix. And the reason why I think this is so interesting is when you're ever going into a tyre dealership, and you start talking to people about, oh, what's the difference between, you know, the Mark One, the Mark Two, the Mark Three, the Mark Four tire? Um, they'll go, oh, well, you know, it comes down to construction, but it comes down to to uh, rubber composites. And you go, what? Well, this is basically a change in the overall chemistry of the rubber itself, injecting different chemicals into it to actually get more out of the tire itself. And this, with Firestone, marks the first recorded basically concept of being able to do that. So by putting carbon into the mix it meant the rubber was much much more resilient to the elements because rubber before then was obviously latex based and latex rubber is fantastic but to the sun's rays for UV and obviously weather conditions it just simply didn't last as long. Now Obviously the automobile was becoming very, very popular within Europe and obviously America at this point in time. And we actually saw um, a couple of French brothers actually come up with the first pneumatic tyre to be fitted onto a motor vehicle. And this was actually made by the Michelin brothers. Now, motor racing, they were big rev heads back then as we are now, and they actually put these tyres on a vehicle that actually didn't quite win but it actually won a very very prestigious race in France. Because of this it obviously generated a lot of publicity and Michelin themselves would become the leading tyre manufacturer of pneumatic tyres for the next 20 years. So pretty impressive and this is virtually all around the same period of time. One of the interesting things about tyres of this period is that it didn't really change. They came up with the idea of the pneumatic tyre and the actual construction of the tyre really didn't develop um, much more for the next 20-30 years. What they would actually do, depending on the load that the tyre itself would actually have to sustain, is they used was nylon and using nylon strands in the actual tyre itself. And these would actually go around the entire diameter of the tyre in a radial motion, you could think. Now, this is something I'll just step off, off topic quickly, but this is why uh, bias ply tyres, and this is what I'm talking about, the development of bias ply, is when you're using bias ply tyres off-road, and many of us still do, because there are advantages to having bias ply tyres in some, in some environments, when you release the pressure and you actually cause it to deflate slightly, and the tyres a little bit old, getting you know, towards the end of its life, 
you need to be really careful because these nylon strands can actually rub together and they can actually rub through. So when you get back on the road, you inflate your tyres up to the optimum pressure for on the road. Obviously there's an area of weakness, drive down the road, the heat builds up and bang, you get a blowout. So that's just a little top tip there, but we'll get back on topic anyway. Towards the end of the 1930s, we actually saw a agricultural revolution. And this was basically the mechanization of agriculture both in America, the Soviet Union, and obviously in Britain too, and right across Europe as a whole. For those of you out there who really love your tractors, you'll know that the Davidson, and I think I've said that right, the Davidson tractor, I think it was 1938, came up with the first design of the three-point hitch, which um, many tractors like the Massey Ferguson and that would only adopt much later on. But because of this, this actually saw that they needed a tyre that could obviously function in very soft ground conditions and very boggy ground conditions too. And this meant Firestone actually came up with a solution. And this is probably one of the first tyres that is designed for an off-road application. And it was known as a 25 bar. Well, you don't have to be a genius to figure out what that means, I bet. But I'll explain it for those of you who are just a bit unsure. Basically, what it refers to is 25 bars of tread. Wow, pretty simple, hey? So 25 bars of tread. So what these bars would be was literally a bar of rubber that would go across or partly go across the actual width of the tyre itself. And typically, these would actually be offset. So this was fantastic in soft conditions. You've got a big tractor, lots of torque, and it would be able to just struggle its way through the soft, mushy ground or the really soft clays and all the rest. So it was a very, very, very popular tyre at the time. However, sadly, towards the end of the 1930s, we saw the outbreak of World War II. And in the six years of war of um, World War II, we saw some of the most incredible pieces of technology being developed. Obviously some of these were obviously not for the right applications, but today we'll look at one of the more noticeable bits of technology. And this is where we see an off-road going tyre used on an off-road going vehicle for the first time. It's amazing. One of the problems that the world's armies were facing at this point in time was an increase in ordnance. The Americans came up with a solution and this would be the Willis Jeep or the Willys Jeep. And this in my mind is the first mass produced off-road going vehicle that has four wheel drive, a differential in the front and a differential in the rear. Now obviously it's all well and good building a vehicle but to actually drive it off-road, what do you need? You need some tyres, don't you? So NDT, the company of NDT, actually came up with what is known as the bar tread. And I'll show a picture of it here. It's a bit easier to understand. So like the 25 bar tread, it follows a similar design, but obviously it's got bars that are offset. So this made it incredibly effective in soft, mushy terrain in America and Europe. Obviously, in sandy conditions in North Africa, it would have proved to be a little bit difficult because it is a little bit aggressive as a tyre as a whole. But this was such a popular tyre. The actual design itself was actually used for truck tyres. It was used on pretty much everything. Uh, the Dingo Armoured Car, Morris Armoured Car, the Dodge Weapons Carrier, the Dodge, I think it's Dodge... Dodge Wood probably made it, but the American Half Track too, and many, many British vehicles also. So hugely popular. The American Armed Forces were so impressed with this tyre, they actually kept using it on their vehicles right up until the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. So really amazing tyre, and you can still buy them today. But in 1948, it was a very special year, at least for me and many Land Rover enthusiasts out there, because this was the launch of the Land Rover Series 1. And the Land Rover Series 1 was, you could say, a little bit of a refinement on the Willys Jeep. It had a few optional extras that the Jeep didn't have, but it also had a new tyre. And this tyre was the Avron Traction Tyre. Now the Avron Traction Tyre is a really special tyre because it's the first tyre that in an off-road application took into account even wear. Now 
one of the issues is with the old bar tread is obviously you've got a bar going right across to here to there another one here and obviously most of the pressure with the tire is in the center so you would actually end up wearing all the bar or all the tread in the center but have plenty of life on the outside perimeters of the actual tire itself so that was a big problem the other issue was was that it was very effective in mud but in wet conditions on bitumen it was absolutely woeful and anyone who's driven a vehicle with bar treads on it will know that only well and truly because the problem is you would only have a small percentage of the overall surface area of the tire actually in contact with the road so the Avron traction tire allowed for more contact with the road itself but still an overall aggressive tread by actually using side lugs as you can see here with this Toyo tire which obviously emulates some of the key principles that were found back then in the 1940s you've got a nice solid column of tread on the inside which is absolutely vital for on-road going conditions well that's what it was for the Avron traction tire and then you've got nice aggressive lugs on the outside to really bite in and dig down in soft, soft um, terrain I guess you could say so that was a massive massive step forward getting into the 1950s though we started seeing a lot of other vehicles come out on the market too we saw the FJ Land or the BJ Land Cruiser that came out we obviously obviously saw the first variants of the Datsun Patrol which would later become the Nissan Patrol too and having an off-road going vehicle in your armed forces was absolutely vital for this obviously a lot more tires were obviously developed to fit these vehicles and we started seeing greater choice on the market but it wasn't really until the late 1960s that we started seeing a revolution in the actual tire design for off-road going applications now in 1948-49 Michelin actually designed the first radial tire to go on a motor vehicle now what do I mean by radial well I spoke to you earlier about using nylon bands in tyres well in a radial tyre they actually use steel cable or steel bands that actually are buried deep within the rubber itself now obviously radial tyres are fantastic they were used on I believe aircraft during the second world war the fantastic thing about them is that you can actually once again you can make the tyre much much lighter in its overall design now the fantastic thing about this with having the steel bands inside it unlike the old bias ply is that you can deflate them down to very low pressures and they can flex a lot more and by doing that and having steel in there they're much much un there's less chance of actually wearing through the actual steel bands in the tire themselves so therefore prolonging the life of the tire and therefore having much better application off-road so that is one of the pluses when it comes to radial tires over bias ply tires but as I said compared to your bias ply counterparts the overall design of the tire is much much lighter it's not as thick in the side walls and all the rest but if you use them correctly they'll get you out of trouble but anyway moving on and one of the um, first tires to actually adopt a radial tire pattern for off-road going application and it's funny they still make, make it to this day is actually the Dunlop SP off-road gripper I've used this on the series 2 for about 10 years and you know fitting it on a vehicle of that era in the 1960s it fits it very very well but consider it you consider using it on more modern vehicles it is a little bit long in the tooth but the quantum leap that we saw obviously going over to the radial tire meant that we could do a lot more with the tire itself it meant that we could build a tire that was much lighter in construction but we could also build much much wider tires too and this brings me on to the very heavily debated subject of wide versus narrow tires and I'm only going to touch on it a little bit because you guys and girls out there you can go out and do your own research and come up with your own opinions on it but the width of the tire actually had big advantages along with the diameter now 
I'll show you a picture here of an exploration vehicle for Shell Oil Company back in the 1960s. This is a Land Rover Series 2 and it's fitted with flotation tyres. Take a note to the overall diameter of the tyre, but also pay attention to the overall width. This was designed to go through Arctic conditions in Alaska where there's a lot of soft terrain, a lot of swamps and all the rest. Now, a prime example of overall footprint, and when I talk about footprint, it's the downward pressure that is actually exerted on the surface that you're travelling over. Now, Operation Barbarossa in 1941, we saw the German Wehrmacht invade the Soviet Union. But coming to the end of summer, going into winter, the mud, the slurry and all the rest had ground the lightning force of the German panzers almost to a halt. However, the Soviets brought a new tank in, the T-34, and this tank was able to nearly almost run rings around the German panzers. And one of the attributing factors to this was that the T-34 actually had much, much wider tracks, so it could actually travel across snow much easier, and it could travel across the melted permafrost, obviously, when that occurred, and obviously the deep, thick mud much, much easier. Whereas the German panzers panzers actually had much narrower tracks and they would actually sink in. The weight of the tanks was very similar and but because the actual T-34 had a much wider footprint it could therefore travel across the mud much much easier. And if you don't believe me the next time you're swimming put yourself into a pin position and I bet you'll start sinking. If you lay on your back though you'll be able to lie there floating all day long. And the reason is that you've actually dispersed your weight over a larger surface area. So that's where if you're in marshy terrains or very soft, muddy terrains, having a wider tyre can be to your advantage. However, in desert conditions, and you'll notice this with a lot of off-road going vehicles, they use a much, much larger diameter tyre. And this is actually to lengthen the overall footprint too. So this is where diameter actually plays an important role. Land Rover themselves with the Series 1 would bring out obviously a normal setup that you could get straight off the mark. Or if you're going into a desert environment, they would actually give you a slightly taller tyre using a 6.50 tyre instead of the 6.00. And this would actually lengthen the overall footprint, because if you think of tyres up here, that's the overall diameter of the tyre, you then deflate it, it's obviously going to spread out over a much greater length. So that's where diameter actually plays an important role. Basically what you need to take into account is obviously where you're going to travel with your tyres, and that's the most important thing. So during the 70s, because of the radial tyre, we saw tyres get a little bit wider. And this is where you had the option of going for balloon tyres or narrow tyres. Towards the end of the 1970s, it was accepted that the radial tyre was the new king of tyres in regards to off-road applications. The Australian Defence Force here stipulated it very clearly in their specifications for the Land Rover Parenti that it would have to run radial tyres. Getting into the 1980s, though, we started seeing a few companies trying to build what I like to call compromise tyres. And these were tyres that could really almost do it all. And one of the best examples of this in a mud terrain tyre, I believe, is the BF Goodridge Mud Terrain Mark I. This actually has an overall even tyre tread and pattern, so it handles relatively well on road. But it isn't as aggressive, obviously, as the bar tread counterpart, but still very, very effective. Moving into the 1990s, we obviously saw the birth and obviously the rise of the SUV and the Range Rover was really probably one of the forefathers of this actual uh, revolution. We saw more on-road, more off-road going vehicles, sorry, used for on-road applications and this obviously saw the rise of the all-terrain tyre, a tyre that was obviously designed to have certain off-road elements but obviously have the ability to be used on bitumen for majority of its lifespan and obviously the on-road going tyre too. What's the difference between a mud terrain tyre AT and an on-road going tyre? Well there's actually a massive difference but I'll just talk about one. It comes back to the old composite of the rubber itself. 
A mud terrain is generally a little bit softer in its rubber construction than obviously an AT and obviously an on-road going tyre. And that's because of the nature of the surface that the tyre itself is designed to obviously traverse over. Obviously coming up to present, where are tyres going from here? Well, it's amazing. We've obviously seen the use of Kevlar in the sidewall, which has once again been able to make the tyre construction much, much lighter, much, much stronger, much, much more durable. And every year, or every couple of years, tyre manufacturers are constantly tweaking and refining the actual chemistry in the tyre itself with different composites and all the rest. So it's absolutely fascinating and there's a lot more to tyres than meets the eye. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Origin series, looking at the origin of the tyre. If you've enjoyed this episode and you've been following our channel for quite some time, please click on the Patreon icon at the top right hand corner of your screen. And for as little as a couple dollars a month, you can help support the generation of content here at Seriously Series. If you're new to the channel and you're just finding out what we're all about and much, much more, please click on the subscribe button down below, click on that notification button too, and you won't miss out on one single video. Anyway, thanks for watching and I hope to see you in our next video.